a good day. Yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. What a good day. Just close your eyes for a minute. Let's allow the Spirit of God just to get down into those inner recesses. You know, my ears are clogged right now with a lot of mucus, allergies, and all that mess, and I can't really hear myself, so if I'm not talking loud enough or I'm talking too loud, let me know. But sometimes we get the same kind of clogging in our spiritual life, that there's stuff down in there that just gets clogged up. So, Father, we thank you right now in the name of Jesus that your word is alive, it's active, it's sharper than a two-edged sword. It's penetrating deep into the core of our being. Father, as we are sitting in your presence right now, we thank you that grace upon grace is being poured on our lives. Father, we thank you that you are going down deep into the roots of who we are. And you're not satisfied for us to live on the surface, but deep is calling unto deep. And Jesus, you called us to greater things, and the degree that we go deep is the degree that we go great. The degree that we go deep is a degree that we go great. So Father, we wanna go deep this morning. We wanna stop living on the surface where the wind and the waves seem to toss us around. But Father, we wanna go deep where nothing can affect us. Father, we want the Apostle Paul's secret to become our secret, that he learned to be self-sufficient in his sufficiency in you, that he was completely content because his life was hidden in you, that nothing could rob him of his peace or joy. Well, Father, I declare that today that we have that same access we have the same place in you that all the great saints of the faith had. And Father, we exercise that faith by going deep. We thank you that you are at work in us and you will continue that work in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to pick up <clears throat> on a little theme that we had last week about the church being the pillar and the bulwark or buttress of truth. If you were here last week or saw the illustration of that bundle of sticks, matter of fact, I got a couple of them right here. A bundle of sticks that represent the truths of God and how that God has given the church the responsibility to be the pillar and the buttress or the bulwark or the thing that binds this truth together to hold it. But when we begin to cut those things, all of a sudden, truth becomes shaky. Truth becomes relative. Truth becomes whatever it wants to be, according to the person who has it. And if there's one thing we know in this culture right now, that truth by its very nature is very secular. It's very narrow. And we don't like to hear those things. We don't like to hear about narrow-minded thinkers, narrow-minded truth. But you know what? Jesus was probably the most narrow-minded person ever walked on this planet because he was single-focused on one thing, doing the will of his Father. And the will of his Father was so great, he had to be single-focused. And we saw that as we began to cut those restrictions off, Proverbs says that if we cut those bands off, if we break off those restrictions, we become unrestrained. And it says, without prophetic vision, we become unrestrained. Without vision for your life, without prophetic understanding for your life, without understanding what is going on, instead of just going along with the crowd, going along with whatever's going along, saying, wait a minute, what is God's truth in this situation? Because wisdom would say the pillar of truth has to remain the pillar of truth. And when we cut ourselves off from that, we become unrestrained and our life goes out of control. You ever see a car skidding on the road? Have you ever skid on the road? Aren't you thankful for guardrails? Yes, sir. I bumped into a few in my day. <laughs> They're there for a reason. I know we're supposed to drive the speed limit. We're supposed to be careful. What happens if, in the moment, you hit black ice or somebody, you know, a squirrel runs out in front of you and you swerve? Thank God for the guardrails. Those guardrails are put there for your protection, not for control. But one of the things we have to understand is that the church has been tasked with the responsibility of being the pillar and the buttress of truth. If God is going to bring truth to this planet, he's going to export it through the church. Now, there is truth all over the place. And we saw last week that when you cut that off, the truth just falls into pieces. And then people pick up those pieces and they run with them and create all kinds of crazy things based on truths that aren't connected to anything else. And I don't know about you, but if your life is not connected to a greater source, you become a life, you become a God unto yourself, that's a dangerous thing. I don't know about you, but I don't want that. And then we saw from Hosea, and I want to turn, if you have a Bible, turn there this morning. There's something so powerful in this for this day and age, and I think every generation has an opportunity to grab a hold of these truths, but God keeps bringing it back around because we haven't 
truly grabbed a hold of it to the place where it transforms us. God's truth is to transform us. So the prophet Hosea in chapter 4, this is where we left off last week. My people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. My people perish, destroyed. That means they die away. It's like a vine or branch pulled off the trunk of a tree. It stays green for a little while, but eventually it just dries up. And this is an indictment against God's people, not against our culture. We know our culture without the, the life presence of God is going to dry up and die. So we shouldn't be surprised at what's happening in our culture right now. It's shocking. It's heart-wrenching. It's gut-wrenching. But we shouldn't be surprised that our culture is dying on the vine because it's not connected to a life source. But what about God's people? This was an indictment against God's people who were given truth, who were given the word. And the prophet Hosea comes and he's laying this out to them because they were, they were playing with fire, if you will. They were being pulled away from the truth into some things that were getting into a lot of trouble. And the whole nation was going down a path of idolatry. They were being enamored by the cultures around them. They were being enamored by the influence of the culture of Babylon. Now, ancient Babylon was one of the wonders, seven wonders of the ancient world. Babylon would be like going to a place like Times Square or Tokyo or some place that's really just a, a total eclectic electric atmosphere. Where if you've come from <clears throat> the hill country or a country bumpkin and you walked into there, you would be just, you're glazed over with all the stuff that's there, the sights and the sounds. Babylon was like that. And the culture that was being exported from Babylon was like that. There was all kinds of things that were enticing. There was magic arts. There was arts. There was science. There was knowledge. There was esoteric things. And it was very tempting to people to want to get sucked into this stuff. Now, the culture of the Hebrews and the culture of Jerusalem was just the opposite. It was very conservative and religious. It would be like an Amish young person being let loose experiencing life without any restrictions. And all of a sudden they realize there's a whole lot more to the world that my parents didn't tell me. Well, the nation of Israel was being enticed by the culture of Babylon that was all around them, all the nations around them. They were worshiping everything under the sun, literally. So Hosea comes and he says, you've got to wake up. You've got to wake up. You've got to understand what's going on. So he says, my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge because you have rejected knowledge. I reject you from being my priests. And since you have forgotten my law or forgotten, ignored it, chose not to know the law of your God, I will also forget your children. Lack of knowledge. Another way to say lack of knowledge, you're destroyed for holding the wrong opinions. Everybody's entitled to their opinions, right? Somebody once said that opinions are like armpits. Some stink more than others. <laughs> But everybody's got a few of them. I've got two, right? Everybody's got at least two armpits. My people are destroyed because they're holding the wrong opinions. Or another way to say it is my people are destroyed, they're perishing because they're following earthly knowledge rather than my spirit. Has anything changed? You just dress it up differently, but it's all the same. It has been since the fall. Nothing has changed. The enemy's tactics are always the same. He just dresses them up in the culture that he lives in. So we need to have our eyes open to see that there is something, <clears throat> excuse me, something so important in this hour for us to get a hold of as the church. So how can this happen? How does a nation who's been given the covenant of God, who's been given the oracles of God, who's been given the truth of God, how can the church of Jesus Christ, which Paul said is the buttress and pillar of truth, how can we get so distracted? How can we get so syncretized which means we take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of this and a little bit of that and then we bunch it together and we think that it's truth. How can it really happen that that can be so prevalent on this planet? Well, jump down to verse <clears throat> 12. My people inquire a piece of wood and their walking staff gives them oracles. My people talk to pieces of wood Trees in the ancient world were very important. Trees in our world are very important. They were seen as a source of spiritual enlightenment. 
even back to the garden with the tree, the knowledge of good and evil, and the tree of life. Jesus was crucified on a tree. The tree represents revelation. It represents knowledge. It represents a place where God speaks. And it says, my people are going to pieces of wood or idols that are carved out of wood. And the same idol that was a tree is now a piece of wood and the same idol you use for walking sticks. My people are going to pieces of wood to find direction for their life. So part of this is a cultural thing where they took walking sticks. And some of the walking sticks had carved on them different icons that were supposed to give them good luck. This was the culture, part of the culture of Babylon. This was part of the magic arts of the oracles of Babylon. So if you wanted to know whether or not it was a good day to travel, if you wanted to know whether or not it was a good time to go into business, whether or not you should invest in something, whether or not you should do whatever, you could go to an oracle and they would take your walking stick and a bunch of other sticks and they'd place them together and then they would let them drop. It's like reading tea leaves. And they would tell you yes or no. It's a good time to go. And the people of God were getting sucked into this fortune telling. They were getting sucked into this easy way to find the answers. How can that happen? Is it possible for the people of God to be that suckered? Is it possible to get that sucked into deception that we wind up going to pieces of wood or things? Well, we may not have walking sticks in our culture, but there is something that the enemy is using in our day to do the exact same thing. Now this is a reference that goes all the way back to a challenge Moses and Aaron had with some of the people of Israel who were upset. Moses was instituting what God had given him to bring order into the nation of Israel. This was a whole nation of slaves for 400 and some odd years. This nation was under an umbrella of slavery. The Israelites did not know how to live free. All they knew how to do was work for the Pharaoh make their bricks, get their meals, and do the same thing all over again the next day. Sounds exciting. So now they're let free, they're let go, and they have no rules, no regulations, no law. They don't know how to do life. They don't even know how to have hygiene. So God is beginning this process of giving them instruction. And part of that instruction was for Moses to set aside Aaron and his clan as priests unto the Lord. Now under the new covenant, all of us are priests, and we're going to get to this in a minute. But one day, about 250 rebels stood up and said, hold on a minute. Why should we have to listen to you and Aaron? Can't we all hear God for ourselves? Why should we listen to you? So there was this great rebellion that was brewing, and Moses was getting nervous because he knew what God had instructed him to do. So God told Moses, don't worry about that. Their argument is with me, not against you. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to get all the elders, one from every tribe of Israel, and I want each one of them to bring their walking stick, which means the staff of authority. Each tribe had an elder, and that elder had a staff or pole or a stick of authority. And that represented, <clears throat> excuse me, in this clan, whatever this person says is the law. So he said, gather the dead sticks. Every one of them. And Aaron, you be the representative for the tribe of Levi. And lay them before the temple, before the tabernacle in the tent. And the rod that buds is the rod that I choose. Jeremiah makes reference to this. If you have your Bible, you can turn back to Jeremiah <clears throat> chapter 1. Now Jeremiah prophesied about 150 years before Hosea, so nothing's really changed. Same story, different day, same problems, same people, just different opportunities. Now, Jeremiah was prophesying before the captivity where the whole nation was taken into Babylon. The very thing that they worshipped was the place they were going to become slaves to. So Jeremiah is about to go on his prophesying journey, and God asks him to look. Now, what that looks like in the spirit, who knows? Did he have his eyes closed? Did he see a vision? Was he dreaming? We don't know. But here's how he explains the call, or the beginning of his call. In verse 11 of chapter 1. And the word of the Lord came to me saying, Jeremiah, what do you see? That's a good question for all of us. When you look out on the horizon of our culture, what do you see? Now anybody 
can pick up a newspaper, although we don't read newspapers anymore. Anybody can pick up any device and become a modern day prophet. Because we can declare what's going on in the world right now just by the very nature of all the bad news. But what do you see? When you see all this, when you see what's going on, Jeremiah, when you see a nation that is whoring after idols of Babylon, that's casting me out of its culture, that's pushing me to the margins, that's testing me to my limits. When you look at this nation, Jeremiah, that's pushing everything of truth out of the way so it can do its own thing, what do you see? What are you looking at? Well, it's obvious to say, I see a stiff-necked, rebellious, stubborn people. I see a culture that's going to hell in a handbasket. I see, it's easy to say that, but what did Jeremiah see? And here's what he sees. And Jeremiah said, I see an almond branch. And the Lord said, you have seen well, for I am watching over my word to perform it. The word almond and the word watching are like, they're, they're, what's, the, what's that word in English where you have two words that sound the same? Begins with an H. Homonym. That's it. They're like homonyms. So the word almond and the word watching are basically the same word in Hebrew. So God said, I am watching over my word to perform it. What was the word? Well, go back to the, 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 the challenge with the branches. In the morning, when Moses took those branches out of the tabernacle, Aaron's dead stick had buds and almonds on it. God is the only one who brings death, life out of death. God is the only one who has the power of his words to bring dead things back to life. And God was saying through this, I'm watching over my word, Moses. Don't you worry about my word coming to pass. Everybody who rebels against my word is going to have to deal with their dead stick. They're going to be inquiring of their dead sticks, inquiring of dead idols, inquiring of things that do not contain truth, only dead wood but I'm watching over my word to perform it. What was the word that he was watching over? He was watching over the word that he was giving the nation of Israel a warning, but he was also giving them an opportunity. He said, if you turn your hearts and repent, if you turn your hearts and repent and bring me back into the center, your nation will prosper. Your children will prosper. But if you read the rest of the story of Jeremiah, it goes into the lamentations of Jeremiah because they pushed got out, and they put Jeremiah in prison. They wouldn't even let him talk. He was censored. He was canceled, if you will. So what does it have to do with us today? Again, has anything really changed? Do we have walking sticks? Do we have wooden idols that we talk to? Well, in this day and age, it looks like this. My people, <clears throat> what did they say? I like that ringtone. It says, my people inquire of a piece of wood and their walking staff gives them oracles. How about my people inquire of a piece of electronic equipment and its commentators give them oracles? We have become discipled by the screen. We have swipeleship. It's, if that word is not yet in the psychological dictionary, it will be. I'm prophesying that because all the research is pointing in a really bad direction. What this little device has been able to do, if you read some of the behind the lines and behind the scenes psychologists going on, it's creating a new identity of what it means to be human. Little kids who are raised on these little screens their reality is inside this little box now. And it's very easy for those little kids to understand how artificial intelligence really is the greater reality than their own reality. And don't you think that it's been the plan of the enemy from the beginning to destroy the image of God? Now, I thank God for technology. I use it all the time. I do all my research. I do a lot of shopping when I have to find things. I do a lot of investigating when I need to fix things. I've learned almost most of the repair techniques I know from other people who know how to do things. Bless God for that. Yes, sir. 
But there is a problem that is plaguing modern culture because we don't know how to manage this. Do you know that it's even hitting senior citizens now? The average adult spends 2.7 hours on social media a day. The average teenager spends five to 7.5 hour, hours a day on social media. The average senior citizen spends almost two hours a day on social media. What it is, it's creating a worldview. It's like sandpaper that's wearing away at truth or how to establish even what truth is. Now again, I'm not dissing technology. I used to be in the technology field. I love what technology can do for us. I love the fact that it gives us the ability to see God's wonder in a different way, to understand the greatness and the vastness of our universe. The more science expands, the more we see the greatness of our God. I thank God for those things. But I also see the enemy takes what God meant for good and turn it <clears throat> into evil. The problem is the body of Christ doesn't have the willpower anymore to discern what this little box is saying. And we need to understand what's happening in our culture. Worldview is a way that you not just see the world, but your worldview is a way that you relate to your world. 51% of Americans claim to be born again Christians, which means that they believe that if they die, they're going to heaven because they've confessed that Jesus is Lord and they confess their sins. But out of those 51%, this is just America, stats are different all over the world, out of that 51%, only 6% of adults can explain a biblical worldview. 4% of young people can explain what it means to have a biblical worldview. 6%. So if we're going to be honest, no hands here. That means that a, a good portion of us sitting in this room would have a difficult time explaining a Christian worldview. Because we have been enamored and things have, have penetrated through our mind through swipeleship. We have created this thing where if we don't like something, or if we want to find something, we just keep swiping until we find what we want. We just keep rolling and scrolling. We keep pointing and clicking, and eventually we're going to find something we want. I didn't want you to turn on. <laughs> Not to mention all the, the, the psychological things that your brain is trying to manage with all that information. You know, information is not knowledge. Information is facts and figures, it's tidbits. Information will go through your senses, your five senses, and eventually it gets formulated inside of you. That's why it's called information. Something is forming inside of you that you can't see. And every time you take in information, you are allowing something to be informed inside of you that eventually your brain thinks that's knowledge because everybody's saying it, everybody's doing it, everybody's wearing it, therefore it must be true or it must be right. You know how many hours of media the average American watches a day? And I'm talking about at work on screens, at play on screens, and just bored out of their gourd on screens. 12.9 hours average between TV, you know, watching movies, that, all media. 12.9, that's half of our day is influenced by media. The average child is going to see more than nine to 10,000 murders and more than 200,000 violent acts before they graduate high school. And these are old statistics. I couldn't find any new ones because I think they're embarrassed to report them. Do you know why it's so difficult to talk about abstinence? When the abortion issue comes up and people say, well, if we talk about abstinence, but we can't talk about abstinence if all of our media is saturated with sex. Because information, it doesn't matter if you say it's wrong as a parent once, if the information says it a hundred times it's okay, guess who wins? Well, we did our best, but you are being assaulted by information. 
that's forming something inside of you. And we just don't understand the subtlety of the gradual of what's happening to truth that is being synchronized with everything else under the sun till it becomes artificial truth, like artificial intelligence, artificial humans, that where is the reality line? Where is it drawn? Think about all the influence. Why is there such a, an outbreak of obesity in young people these days? How many hours of commercials of junk food have they absorbed? How many hours of sexual immorality have they absorbed into their brains as information before they actually act it out? It's just a matter of time before what you take in is formed in you so you begin to act it out. And then you begin to bring correction to the behavior and it's too late. Because the correction is not the behavior you correct, it's the information that you correct. And you can't correct the behavior in some ways because it's already a habit and a pattern. And all you're doing right now is managing the inevitable. And our education systems, our media, they're all just managing the inevitable. That our kids are going to have sex, so we might as well teach them how to do it in kindergarten. Where did that come from? When my kids were in high school, there were some wacky things that the sex ed was teaching. But where, how did we get from that point to the point where kindergartners need now to understand sexual, sexuality and everything else under the sun. Information is bombarding us. So what do we do? Do we put our head in the sand? Do we throw the baby out with the bathwater? Can you imagine what happened if we had to leave our cell phones for a whole week at home and not bring them with us? I, I, look at your faces. Oh my gosh, I can hear hearts beating. I can see beads of sweat because we can't go out without it. This is our walking stick. This is what gives us security. Now again, there are some really positive things about having this. But what about what this is telling us? Hey Google, hey Siri. And many of us go to Google and Siri before we go to the Word. And we take what Google and Siri says and we mix it in with the Word and we try to say, well, you know, we're in a different age and culture. That's Old Testament stuff. That was old. Wait a minute. Does truth ever go out of fashion? Does truth ever change? Does, does truth go into cultural sways? No. Strip it down to its bare bones and truth is truth. You dress it up any way you want. So what's the answer? Do we need an answer? Do you really want the answer? Do you want the answer? I'm not talking to throw these in the garbage, but these need to become the slave rather than the master. But turn over to Hebrews. Say, I asked for this. You don't sound very convinced. The book of Hebrews, <clears throat> chapter 4. Now, Hebrews was written, we're not quite sure who the author was. There's arguments about Paul, some say Apollos, some say somebody else. But the book of Hebrews was written mainly to a culture where a lot of Hebrew origin Christians lived. It was a place where most of the believers were coming out of, of Hebrew thought. And they were still practicing a lot of their Jewish roots by most accounts, the Apostle James was part of this culture, that he never really left his Jewish Hebrew roots. There's nothing wrong with practicing your culture unless your culture begins to conflict with truth. So James, to the day he died, was probably a very devout Jewish believer, and that's okay. So this group of Hebrews, they were trying to stay true to their roots, but they were having a problem with what was going on in their culture. And the problem was that they had the Roman Empire breathing down their necks because as far as the Romans were concerned, the, the Hebrew religion or the Jewish religion was a sanctioned religion under Rome. You were able to practice that without being persecuted. But the Jews, who were still Jewish to the core, who rejected Jesus, they were ratting out the other Hebrews saying, whoa, they're not part of us. They worship Jesus. 
They don't call Caesar Lord. They call Jesus Lord. So now they had the Jews on one side, the Romans on the other side, squeezing down on them. These are probably the most persecuted class of all the Christians during the first century. So they had a lot of decisions to make. But what was happening was the pressure from the culture was getting so tough that many of them decided to mix the old religious ways of Judaism into their Christianity so they wouldn't be seen as Christians. So they water it down enough so there would be no persecution. They could keep Jesus but also incorporate everything else so they would look just like a Jew to a Roman. But in doing that, they were rejecting the truth of who Jesus was. They would rather have peace in their community than have persecution for the truth. And the writer of Hebrews is saying, you've got to make up your mind. <clears throat> if you are going to exist as the pillar of truth, you've got to make up your mind. You can't have it every way. You can't just incorporate everything around you to make you fit in, to make you feel like you've got it. You've got to make some decisions that are going to be uncomfortable. You still want me to read this? Are you sure? All right. I didn't write this. I'm just reading what was written. Verse 11 of Hebrews 5. Did I say 4? Yes. I am so sorry. 5. <clears throat> about this we have much to say. About what? The first four chapters was a precursor to who Jesus as a high priest was. They understood high priest language because they were Jewish Christians. So the writer of Hebrews is trying to say, as much as you have this high priest system, Jesus is part of the order of Melchizedek. I'm not going to go into that because even the writer of Hebrews says, that's a story for another day. But you should know that story is what he's saying. Because Christians have become so lazy. We've become so used to being spoon-fed. So used to saying, well, I don't understand it. I don't like that. Give me something better that we don't stay on one page long enough to really understand. So the writer of Hebrews is saying, I wish I could explain this to you, but I can't because you can't understand it. So here's what he says. About all of this, we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you have become dull of hearing. Ooh. You become dull of hearing. I'm dull of hearing right now because I got mucus in my ears. But that's not what he's talking about. Dull of hearing, the word dull of hearing is a phrase that comes from being a bastard. No, a legitimate, illegitimate. <laughs> Not the curse word bastard, yes. but the actual meaning of what a bastard is. Is a child born from a man who is not, from a woman who is not his wife, who is still kind of cared for, but yet not part of, parcel of the family. You have become dull of hearing. In other words, you have given up your rights, birth rights, for the sake of being comfortable, for the sake of not having trouble, for the sake of fitting in with your culture. You become dull of hearing. You can't hear what the Spirit is saying because you're choosing that over this. Dull. You're not sharp. You can't get it. When things are said, it goes right over your head. And there are a lot of things that when God says, what do you see when you look in the culture? I see a mess, God. Wonderful. A three-year-old could tell me that. But what do you see? What do you see my word doing in this culture right now? The writer of Hebrews is saying, you should be able to say that. But you become dull of hearing. For by this time, you ought to all be teachers. By this time, you ought to all be teachers. Look at your neighbor and say, are you a teacher yet? Now, we're not talking about a teacher in the sense where you're standing up teaching a class. That's a gift. That's a calling, and that's an office. We're talking about being able to know what you believe and be able to explain it to someone who has no clue what you're talking about. Beyond a shadow of a doubt to say, I know what I believe and I know why I believe it and I can explain it. Everyone 
should be able to teach. The goal is each one, reach one, and learn how to teach one. Let's say that. Each one, reach one, learn how to teach one. Let's be honest. How many of us feel absolutely confident that we would know how to teach somebody the foundational principles of faith, knowing where the scriptures are, knowing how to read the scripture, knowing how to understand the scripture, how to explain the scripture, and how to guide somebody in the wisdom of the scripture. The writer of Hebrews is saying the reason that you are suffering right now the way you're suffering is because you still don't stand on your own two feet. You're waiting for somebody to put the spoon in your mouth again. I mean, I've, I've seen and read articles of nine and ten year olds still nursing. Oh. Whatever. But what about an adult going in a restaurant if the waiter or waitress came over and brought a bib and a little bottle of baby food and a little spoon and was feeding them? Would it be kind of strange? That's what this picture is. That when you gather together, everybody's got their bib on and you sit there like little birds, ah, ah, ah. Ah, and then somebody's going to come around and go, here you go, here you go. And then they wipe the little drool off your face and do goo goo gagas. That's the picture without being facetious and without being, well, it is kind of funny. But that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. When are we going to grow up? When are we going to stop depending on something else or somebody else? to manage our lives, to manage our faith, to be able to be confident that when I pick this up, I know what it is, but I also know what it isn't. I know why this is the most authentic book on the planet, by far than any other writing in history. There's more evidence, internal and external evidence for the veracity of this word than any other book in history. By miles, we should know that and we should know why. We should know how to handle this. But yet, this is a whole lot easier. Google, what should I do? Or Google, what does the Bible say when? Do you know who's behind Google and Siri? There are things called algorithms. Do you know what algorithms do? They are a process of going from one place to another to give you what you want. They have to be programmed by somebody. And if the programmer is not a godly person, you are doing a crapshoot asking Google and Siri for information and for wisdom. Now, again, there's good stuff. I mean, you might get facts or facts, but how many of you know in this world of facts, the facts are not always the facts. The truth is not always the truth. And what you see today can be a vapor tomorrow. So we base our lives on what Siri and Google are telling us and all of a sudden we find out it's not true anymore because we don't go to the Word first. How many believers feel totally confident in what this book really can do? How many really feel confident that you don't need to go to any other source but this. You know the book of Proverbs has so much packed into it that just one sentence of a proverb a day, there's 31 proverbs, you can pack one proverb a day for the whole month and just keep bringing them over and over again. But one sentence out of one of those proverbs is packed with wisdom to make you successful in every area of life. But yet we spend time doing this, looking for advice when all you gotta do is go to this. By this time, you ought to all be teachers. You and I ought to be able to sit down with somebody who's having trouble and say, let me bring it to the Word. Instead of giving good advice, how about God's wisdom? Now, we mix good advice with God's wisdom, hopefully, when we're talking. Because we don't have to thus say the Lord to every person when we're talking to them. But if we don't have a scriptural foundation for what we believe, we don't have a Christian worldview. Because a Christian worldview is basically saying, I see the world the way God sees it. Another way of saying it is this. A Christian worldview holds the same opinions about life as God does. And anywhere my opinions conflict with God's opinions, I don't have a Christian worldview. 
If my political views are based around political parties or personalities, I don't have a Christian worldview. If my political and my governmental thought process is not based around morality, I'm not thinking the way God thinks. If my sexuality, the way I view sexuality, is not based on how God views it, I don't have a biblical worldview on sexuality. I can't just say, well, that's what kids are going to do. It's different now. What have I just done? I've just allowed the culture of the world, the Babylon system, to become part of my worldview. And then I wonder why my sums don't add up. I wonder why things aren't working out well. So what's the solution? For by this time you ought to all be teachers, but you need someone to teach you the basic principles of the oracles of God. The oracles of God aren't these high pithy sayings that are too hard to understand. The oracles of God are one-liners. Do you ever hear like a one-liner that's a zinger? You hear it and you go, whoa. And you, that carries you into a realm of revelation. That's what this means. That we have to get our ears tickled. Listen to some other, <clears throat> other writings. First Peter chapter 3, verse 15. Here's how Peter did this, or Peter expressed this. Have no fear of man, nor be troubled, but in your hearts honor Christ as Lord, as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is within you, and do it with gentleness and respect, not cramming truth down people's throats, but always being prepared to give a reason for your hope. Well, why are you so happy? Why are you so hopeful? Why aren't you afraid? Why do you do that? Why do you do this? Well, you know, I just wake up in the morning, I, I, I choose to live a good life. Well, is that the truth? You and I should be able to regurgitate right out. Here's a reason why I have hope. Here's what God has done in my life. Here's what God has said. How about another one from 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5? Did I say five? Fifteen. A little bit off. Remind your church of these things <clears throat> and charge them before God not to quarrel about words which do not do any good, but only ruins the, hearers, ruins the heart of the hearers. But do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, as a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. But avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more ungodliness. Don't be ashamed, but rightly handle the word of truth. Back at 1 Peter, chapter 2. So put away all malice and deceit and hypocrisy and every form of slander. And like New York, newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk that by it you may grow up into salvation. That you may grow up into salvation. Two more. First Timothy. <clears throat> Let us read this one. Second Timothy chapter 4. I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having their ears itchy, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, and they'll turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be sober-minded, enduring, enduring and suffering to do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. People want their ears tickled because we can't endure sound teaching anymore. When was the last time you read a whole book? 
You know that the reading stats are going like this right now? Because this has created the inability to read more than a page or two. That our children do not know how to read books. Now there's nothing wrong with reading articles and reading little snip snippets, but what about giving your attention to something? What about discipline? We've lost our ability to be disciplined anymore. So look back at Hebrews. For you need milk and not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is a child. Unskilled. The word unskilled there means can't put it into words. It's like a child who's learning how to talk. Do you ever see how frustrated kids get sometimes? When you think you know what they want and you're, they're saying something and they're not getting it and they get frustrated. You ever feel like that sometimes where the words just don't come out? You want to say something? The writer of Hebrews is saying that if we don't grow up, we never learn how to talk. We never learn how to articulate our faith. We're always talking about what feels good to us. We're always talking about an experience rather than the actual truth because we don't know how to put it into words. Now, we may have trouble with that. And one of the responsibilities of the, the leaders in the body of Christ in, he, in Ephesians 4 is to equip the body. The word equip there means to make something as it ought to be. So the job of the leadership of our church, and I include all of you in that, because if you're part of this family, you're in leadership. You're growing in leadership because each one is going to reach one and eventually learn how to teach one. Each one is going to reach one and eventually learn how to teach one. Because if everything gets bottlenecked up here, then a lot of people aren't being reached and a lot of people aren't being teached. That's not a word. <laughs> so where are the leaders of this church? Everyone in this room is a leader in training. Everyone in this room falls under the auspices of this scripture verse that we can't pass this responsibility off. We can learn how to do this. But can we sit still long enough? If we put this down, we can begin to learn the process of becoming more disciplined. Everyone who lives on milk, and we all know what that means, a nursing child, one who can't feed themselves, one who can't prepare for themselves, one who's depending on someone else to feed them spiritual sustenance. Well, we just saw in First Peter that it's important that we all are fed milk when we first get started because our digestive system isn't built up yet. We don't know how to do that. My little grandson there can't go to the sink, I mean to the stove and make what he wants. He's got to have somebody to do it for him. But there's a point in time when we have to grow up. Say grow up. Grow up. Grow up. And in a Christian sense, that means you know how to feed yourself. That means you have teeth. That means you can sit long enough. You can study. How many love to study? How many love to put themselves in a position where they have to discipline their time? Where they're not just reading to feel good, but they're reading to understand truth. When they're spending time in prayer, not just on their own needs, but to be able to understand revelation for somebody else. Think about what the requirement is and what he's asking for. Everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness since he is still a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of their discernment trained by constant practice. Ugh. Those who have their emotions trained by constant practice. Those who have their senses trained by practice. Those who don't get led by every whim, every wind, every thought, every cultural thing. How do we know if something is right or wrong? Because it says right at the end of here, it says the power of discernment to be trained by constant practice to distinguish good and evil. We have lost the ability to know what's right and wrong, let alone what's real or not real. And we, we've we pour all this information into the pot of our worldview and we come up with something less than a biblical worldview. But because we call ourselves believers, we expect that it's going to work. Well, it's certainly not changing our culture. And how is it doing changing us? Because many of us are still not able to eat solid food. We don't know how to feed ourselves. 
So one of my prayers, one of my goals is to go back to the basics in the atmosphere we're creating in our family. That the desire to learn comes back. There is a renaissance right now. It's underneath the radar screen right now, but it's a renaissance of learning. Where people are realizing that this, they're not learning from this. They're being informed with information, but they're not learning how to think. The word says that we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Another verse or another scripture that's translated differently, it says that we are to be transformed by, by transforming the way that we think. Not just what we think about, but the way that we think. We have a whole generation of kids who don't know how to critically think. Siri, Google, what do I do? Where do kids go for dating advice? Where do young mothers go for maternity and, and uh, postnatal advice? They push aside the wisdom of their culture, of their, their elders, and they go to peers, or worse, artificial intelligence. A robot is telling you how to do this. Because somebody made an algorithm that says, if this is the problem, here are possible solutions. And who knows which one you're going to get. Based on your searching preference, you may get a thousand different things. We have lost the art of learning. And God wants to bring that back to his people. Because of all the people on this planet, if we don't know how to handle the truth, how can God, handle, how can God give us the truth to handle? We're responsible for the amount of truth that's on this planet right now. We are responsible for managing our own life, but also helping people manage their lives by using the word as a guide. Well, that sounds old-fashioned. Well, God's pretty old. God is pretty old, but his word is always current. There are some cultural practices that morph over time, but the immutable truth never changes. The reasons why premarital sex is damaging have been true from the beginning of time as they are now. Not just because science finds out or psychology finds out. Who cares if they ever catch up with God's truth? It's wonderful when they do, but if we're not going to go to the source, then we're going to have our own problems. There's an old adage that says, whatever you consider your source will determine your course. Whatever you see as your source of truth is going to determine your course. So my heart and my prayer is to create an atmosphere in our family where we learn how to love learning. We learn how to read. We learn how to feed. We learn how to get into the word and break it down. We create atmospheres. We create opportunities. Each one, reach one, and learn how to teach one. So we're not a whole culture full of spiritual babies who are with bibs and bottles waiting for someone to feed them but who can run the race, their own race, and say, I know how to handle the word of truth. I have to be willing to be taught. I have to be willing to learn. But I also have to be humble. Because the wisest among us is the humblest among us. And I believe that the smartest person is the one who believes that they don't really know everything yet. So here's the end of the story. After saying all that, <clears throat> it can be a pretty... It could be pretty much of a, a wet blanket on your parade. It could be sobering, and it's meant to be, because we live in serious times. The problems of this world are not going to be solved by robots, although some would like us to believe that. The problems of this world are not going to be solved by superintelligence, although some would like us to believe that. The problems of this world are only going to be solved by truth. And as we saw last week, the church is the pillar and the bulwark of truth. That's an awesome responsibility. So after saying all those things, the writer of Hebrews probably knew in his heart that the people hearing this were probably walking across the floor with their mouth hanging open. He encourages them and he says this, verse 9. Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of much better things. Things that belong to salvation... For it is not unjust for God to overlook, for God is not so unjust to overlook your work and the love that you have shown in his name by serving all the saints, and you still do. 
And we desire that each one of you to show the same eagerness to have full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but be imitators of those who through faith, faith and patience inherit the promises. The writer says, we are encouraged of better things about you. And I am too. I am encouraged that God is doing a deep work in you and that you are going to take your responsibilities seriously. You're going to take your call as the pillar of truth seriously. That is not just for someone else, it's for you because you're a leader. You're a pillar in the house. And each one of us needs to know why we hope and what that hope is all about. So I'm asking, this is a modest proposal, would you be willing to become that leader that God can depend on to learn how to handle the word of truth to the point where he can bring anybody into your life and you'll be willing to have someone come into your life who knows nothing and impart to them truth. And the great picture is this. Philip of the First Testament church. He was just a normal guy. He was a deacon in the church and God used him because he prepared his heart. He was skilled in the word of truth. And he's walking down the road one day and this chariot zips past him and he hears this eunuch reading the scriptures from Isaiah. And he's intrigued, so he runs alongside of the chariot. And this guy is reading and he says, hey, what are you reading? And he goes, I'm reading the scripture verse, but I don't understand it. So he hops into the chariot and he goes, well, what are you reading? I'm reading from the prophet Isaiah and it talks about, and he explains what he's talking about. He says, but I don't understand it. And it says, Philip, from that scripture, was able to explain the full truth about Jesus. And that's the goal. Anywhere a person enters your life, you can pick up right there and explain about Jesus. That's the goal. That you are so confident that you can take whoever God brings into your life, wherever they're at, start at that point and bring them through the story of Jesus. And know that it's not just saying, well, God loves you so much, which is true, but to be able to explain the whole problem, beginning to end, and then the solution being the hope that we have in Jesus. If that's in your heart, God needs to know it. Because he said that he's going to train us. You know what training is all about? Sweat. <laughs> Pain. Matter of fact, the word that's used there, who, people who had their senses trained by the word of righteousness. It's a picture of the Greek Olympic Games where anybody who wanted to be an athlete had to be willing to come under the tutelage of a trainer and I'll tell you what, it was not fun. It was brutal. Because some of those games were brutal. And if you aren't prepared, you're going to be in bad shape. So it's one of those things where you say, okay, I want it. But do you want to be trained? Do you want to go in the ring with Jesus and have to do the rounds? Are you willing to change your schedule? Are you willing to do something about this? And this is across the board. And I would venture a guess that some of us have an addiction. We can't not look at it. We can't not check it. We hear a ding. We hear a notification. <laughs> this is, this is, controls us. Yeah. We have become discipled by social media. Our norms come from what other people are saying, what the culture is saying. We're going to have to do something about all this stuff. The next generation is watching. And if they see more of this than more of this, guess what they're going to do? This is irrelevant. This is where I'm going to go. So who wants to take a stand? Then you may take a stand. Well, Father, it's not always easy and it's not always fun to be a pillar of truth because pillars are made to hold weight 
So Lord, right now, I thank you that you see these pillars who are standing here. Lord, that they are asking to be made strong. Father, there's no condemnation. Lord, there is no guilt. There is no guilt trips. There is no coulda, shoulda, wouldas. Lord, this is completely a heart response. Lord, that each one of us wants to reach one and wants to teach one. It's discipleship instead of swipeleship. Father, we're making a choice today that you're the one who's going to rearrange our schedule. We're not <clears throat> going to come under the thumb of man. We're not going to come under a rigid, religious spirit. But Father, we're going to listen to your spirit. And Father, we want to be disciplined. We want to be trained. And Father, we ask you right now to go to the core of our believer and anywhere in our worldview that doesn't represent you, we're asking you to bring it to the surface so we can correct it. And Father, I thank you that the good work that you start, you are faithful to finish. We bless you now. In Jesus' name, amen. So on our part, we want to create opportunities for learning. We want to create opportunities for you to grow. So search your own heart. Search your, your knowledge base of the word. Where are you right now? Where's your weakness? Where do you want to build up? What do you want to build in? And then begin to press into God and say, okay, what do I have to do to shore up these weak points? But we want to create a culture here where learning is part of our experience. And then imparting that learning is also part of our experience. Amen? Amen. 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 Well, let the Lord bless you. See you on Wednesday for worship night. Have an awesome day. And Mason is making cheeseburgers. And that's the truth.